So we salted the parking lot. <laughs> of course, had we not salted the parking lot, then you'd be yelling at us going, why didn't you salt the parking lot? It's hot, it's cold. We've had winter for two days. And then there was time change. So I don't, I don't know how many of you were supposed to be at the eight o'clock service. <laughs> and just now coming in, we welcome you. Uh, but, it's, but it's been quite, uh, quite the weekend. So we're all glad, that, uh, glad you're here and glad the, the snow was no more than a, a morning's entertainment. One of the good things about being pastor here for 25 years is when I came, uh, a lot of the charter members uh, were still engaged in the life of Brentwood Baptist Church. Some of them are still uh, actively engaged. Uh, Bill Wilson was, was, um, became a very good friend, the founding pastor of this church, mentor. Uh, and uh, he and I enjoyed a lot of good times together, a lot of conversations about you and about what he knew about you and what he learned about you and things that I needed to know about you came in those conversations between Bill and I. Uh, a lot of conversations about who this church was becoming in those critical years of, of moving from 409 Franklin Road to here and the identity that we would have and the DNA. And it was those stories uh, that we tell often, like uh, meeting uh, in the uh, basement of the children's home and what the church learned when there was just a handful of them. Uh, and how uh, those lessons of God's faithfulness when you didn't see how it could work. Uh, the, one of the stories we tell often about, uh, about this church is uh, this church was one of the first churches in the United States to build a gymnasium before it built a sanctuary. Uh, now remember in the early 70s in Brentwood there wasn't the Y, there wasn't anything for children to do. So this church made a, a real bold uh, statement to the community and it built a gym that doubled as a worship center. And uh, you will hear stories, and some of you were in the fellowship of the chairs. After Sunday service, you would get up, you would grab a chair, and you would stack the chairs so the kids could play basketball and roller skate. And that was one of the first outreaches of our church to the local community. A friend of mine says he knew he was no longer a kid when he stood up after Sunday service and his dad said, grab a chair. He was a man now because he had to carry chairs. A lot of those things happened. Uh, that building was built when Clarence Edmonds, uh, the chairman of the finance team at the time, walked around the church during worship and handed you a legal pad. On that legal pad, you would write your name, your address, where you worked, and how much of the church loan you would be willing to co-sign for. This was not a pledge. You were on the hook. So if the church defaulted its loan, then you would owe the bank whatever amount you put. That was the collateral that Clarence Edmonds took to the bank for the first loan that built the church at 409 Franklin Road. Can you see me walking into a bank now <laughs> with a legal pad? going, we're good for this. I don't think so. But those are the stories that have been passed down to us. So when we come up against a challenge like the Middle Tennessee Initiative, and we begin to see, we know how God has worked in the past. We have all of those dots. And in, in those dots, we can draw a line, and we can draw a line directly from our past into our future. Because we know what God has done, we can see what He is doing, and we can see what He will yet do. We remember those stories. The biggest challenge for us as members of Brentwood Baptist Church right now is if that we forgot what God has done. And in forgetting that, we would not be able to see what he was yet going to do. That's the story of the book of Judges. Stand with me now in honor of God's word as we begin this good series. 
We're going to start right in the middle of a story. The second chapter, verse 10. Now that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. And after them another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshiped the Baals and abandoned the Lord God, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after the other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them, and they infuriated the Lord, for they abandoned him and worshiped Baal and the Ashtoreths. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he handed them over to the marauders who raided them. He sold them into the enemies around them so that they could no longer resist their enemies. And whenever the Israelites went out, the Lord was against them, and He brought disaster on them, just as He had promised and sworn to them. So they suffered greatly. And after that, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works He had done for Israel. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. And the cycle starts all over again of knowing you, worshiping you, of forgetting you, and losing ourselves, coming to repentance, worshiping you, and starting all over again. Lord Jesus, this cycle has been going on since the time of the judges, and we are so tired of it. Rescue us from this circle of death. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Today we begin a new series uh, called The Gospel According to the Judges. Now, this series comes out of uh, Jay Strother's private Bible study. Jay is the pastor of our uh, Spring Hill campus, uh, Station Hill, the church at Station Hill. Uh, is doing a, a marvelous job down there, and the church is running into space problems and all of that. All the good problems you want to have as a pastor of a church, they have. And, uh, and we're very proud and, and celebrate the work that's going on there. But, but Jay came to the preaching team out of his own Bible study and said, hey, I've been working in the book of Judges. I've been studying the book of Judges. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm finding out. Uh, and what he told us was, this book of Judges sounds a lot like the conversations I'm having with my people. His congregation is a little younger than ours. And one of the, the issues that we're studying as the pastors uh, of, our, of our campuses is how we respond and how we deal with the challenge of the millennials. Millennials, uh, according to most research, millennials have about 4%. About 4% of the millennials will tell us that they are Christ followers, uh, will, will admit to being an evangelical uh, follower of Christ. That means 96% of the evangelicals do not know Christ. And so how do we as, as congregations like Station Hill, Avenue South, Woodbine, um, uh, Lachlan, that's going to be right in the middle of East Nashville, uh, how do we respond to this challenge? And how do we respond to a generation that, is, that has been told there is no truth? Uh, your, your truth is your truth. What you find out to be your truth uh, is, is what works for you. That all the claims of religion are equal. And so if, uh, if you claim to be a Christian, that's fine. If you claim to be a Buddhist, that's fine. They're all the same. And this is the generation, much like the generation of the judges, uh, that we find ourselves in. And so we started working through this process with Jay and together as pastors and came up with a sermon series. So to give you just a little, a little background of judges, judges follow us Joshua. You knew that already, didn't you? Okay, now th here's why that's important. Joshua follows Deuteronomy. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. Joshua becomes a leader of the Israelites. At long last, the Israelites have been given permission by God to enter into the Promised Land. Remember, they got up to the Promised Land, and then they lost their nerve, and they lost their faith in God, so God made them circle the wilderness for 40 years. 
Now that punishment is over, they're ready to go into the promised land. And Joshua leads them with some measure of skill, confidence in God. Jericho falls. There is victory after victory throughout the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua has died. And we don't know who's in charge. Now, not only do we not know who's in charge, the people don't remember what God has done since he freed them for Egypt, from Egypt. This generation coming up doesn't remember the stories. Now, when you heard that phrase and the next generation came up that did not know the Lord, did it set off any memories for you? Did it remind you of anything? Sure it did. Exodus. The beginning of the Exodus story is the uh, rising up of a new Pharaoh, remember, who didn't know Joseph, who didn't know the work that God had done through Joseph, and the story turns dark for the Israelites. There is this ominous warning that now something is about to go terribly wrong because there's a generation who doesn't know. There's a generation who doesn't remember. Now, your first question is, how does that happen? How in the world can you experience the things that we read about in the Bible and all of a sudden they just not come up? It's not something you tell your children. Really, you were once slaves in Egypt. God brought you out of Egypt. Now you forget to bring that up. Uh, he fed you manna in the wilderness. He fed you water in the wilderness. He took care of your enemies in the wilderness. And now it's just something you don't bring up. What happened? You know, happens to us. They got busy. They were doing life. They were raising kids, getting the kids up to school, come home, too much homework. Teachers are always assigning too much homework. Now we got to do homework. Now we got to take care of the yard. We got to take care of the house. It's one thing wandering around in the wilderness. Now we got to take care of stuff. You know you're supposed to have some kind of devotional time with your, with your kids. You know that. But you sit down with them and say, okay, we need to have a devotion. And they roll their eyes. Do we have to? I don't want to. We already go to church. Do we have to go to church every day? And you're thinking, okay, forget it. And you take them to church. Or you hire professionals to tell your children. But you don't. You make sure they go to the best schools. You make sure they have the best health care. You make sure they have every advantage to live life to the fullest except this one thing. They don't know who they are. And when you don't tell them, when you don't teach them, this is who you are. This is your name. This is what it means to be who you are. When you don't teach them who they are, the world will name them. And the world always gets it wrong. We thought the internet would open up all kinds of new things. I'm old enough to remember when the internet was born. I remember they talked about this is going to change business. It's going to change education. You can be anywhere and have access to the greatest teachers, the greatest minds. It's going to change the way that we live our lives. People are going to be staying more connected. And guess what? We sell porn on it. We use it to troll each other. What is that? We find ways to talk bad about each other, but we don't have to do it in person. Now we call gossip fake news. It used to be gossip. Now the internet has a whole thing of fake news. And because our children don't know who they are, 
they believe what the internet tells them. And the world eats them alive. How does that happen? It happens because you and I no longer live out of the overflow of Christ in our life. Okay? Understand, if you try to sit down, and, and we've all done it, right? Okay, I feel guilty. I'm, I'm not being the man of the house. I'm not being the woman of the house. I need to be. We're going to have a devotion, kids, and I have to break every bone in your body. We're going to sit right here, and we're going to love Jesus for the next 10 minutes. You know, we've all had that, right? You've all been traumatized by that. If that conversation with your children doesn't come out of the overflow of your own walk with Christ, it will never work. Okay? It has to be the kind of thing where when they tell you something, you'll say, you know, that reminds me of a story I read in the Bible. That reminds me something that I, that I read that Jesus said. It has to be that kind of conversation. It has to come up that easily. It has to be that natural or it will never, ever work. So the first thing you and I have to do is to make sure that we keep our eye on Christ and that relationship reminds, remains vital and overflowing. But that's not what happens when you get to Canaan. Canaan had little shiny things. And us with our spiritual ADD, we quit paying attention. Now, there was never a big crisis. See, we always get ready for this big crisis, right? I'll never deny Jesus, right? When, they, when the communists come and tell me I'll have to deny Jesus, they'll just have to shoot me, right? It's never that way, all right? It's little bitty things. It's little bitty things like, well, let's go to Canaan. A guy meets a girl. She's in another tribe. She's very pretty. She's very nice. Family says, well, I think it'll be okay. She's of a different faith. Get the love conquers all. No, it doesn't. Love conquers all. So she moves in with her new husband. And she says, do you mind if I have a little goddess in the kitchen? It helps me stay happy while I'm cooking. And the guy says, happy wife, happy life. I don't care. And he loses control of the kitchen. She says, do you mind if I bring a little goddess in our bedroom? This is the goddess that blesses having babies and I wanna have lots of babies for you and he loses control of the bedroom. Pretty soon, he's got little goddesses and little gods in every room of his house, and he's lost control of his life. When she says, I really don't feel comfortable going to church with you. When you stand up and say there is no God but God, that's kind of exclusive. It means everybody else is wrong. And that makes me feel bad, so he quits going. Does this sound familiar at all? Does this feel familiar? What happens to uh, you know, the guys, right? You're not going to deny Jesus ever. No. So you pray, if you'll grant me success, Lord, I'll make sure you get all the credit and all the blessing. And he gives you success. But success comes at a price. Nothing's free. So if you really want to be the success that you claim you want to be, then you need to stay later at the office and you just have to make sure your wife and kids understand that you're paying this price for them. Yeah, sometimes it means that in order to be at the meeting in Dallas on Monday morning, you have to leave on Sunday. And well, Jesus would just have to understand that in this world, in this time, this is just what it takes now. And yeah... Now come to you and say, hey, uh, we noticed in the meeting the other day when this big decision was, was, was before us, you told everybody you wanted to pray about it a little bit. Listen, that really offended two or three of the guys in the group. We don't mind that you're a Christian. That's fine. Just, just don't say anything about it. You don't call it idolatry.
but it is. And now you're thinking, if that happens, then God would strike me with lightning, right? You would think that the front page of the Tennessean would be filled with stories of being people struck by lightning, right? So-and-so went up to the platform to receive the award for being the best ever in the world, Bip, hit by lightning. And it'd be story after story after story where people who had promised God something, been blessed by God, were hit by lightning. It's not that way. And some of you are foolish enough to think you've gotten away with something because God hasn't punished you. Let me tell you about His punishment. Judges tells you. It's worse than you can ever imagine. You see, God takes your free will very seriously. And one of the hard lessons of Scripture is how seriously God takes our choices. If you choose, He will let you choose. If you choose to be with Him, He'll respect that choice and give you all the good that comes from that choice. If you choose not to be with Him, He will respect that decision and let you go. The rich young ruler, remember? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know the commandments? And he says, I've kept them since I was a kid. Go sell everything you have, come back, follow me. And then we're told in that story that the man was broken hearted because he had so much stuff that he couldn't see parting with it to come follow Jesus, and he walks away. Now you're looking for the next verse to say that Jesus ran after him. It doesn't. Jesus let him go. Some of you, when you're faced with these little decisions of idolatry, You think you're okay because God didn't strike you with lightning. Worse, He just let you go. Now you're on your own. You got off a bus at the Greyhound station guitar in your hand and a song in your heart. If God would just give you this career, you would never forget. And He did. And now you walk in the halls of your home and there are plaques and trophies, and Grammys and gold records. And you get to the end of the hall and you look and you realize you've got nothing. God let you walk away. The Israelites could never quite get it together after that. Because they told God he didn't, they didn't want him in his in their lives. And he didn't force his way in. Oh, we've got other stories. We've got stories of Gideon. We got stories of Samson. And for short periods of time, the people get refocused. For short periods of time, the people repent and, and get. But as soon as that strong leader leaves, the story starts all over again. And in the end, Israel never fully possesses the promised land. Did you know that? Because when they got into the promised land and they started making all these compromises and all these side deals, they never fully possessed all the land that was promised to Abraham. Never did. Little deals with high prices. You know, one of the things about people is we don't change all that much. That's my problem with evolution. 
we just haven't evolved all that much. We're still pretty much the same. And you can read ancient stories, and people will say, we don't know why that king did that. And every guy in the room will go, we do. He's a guy. That's why he did that. Makes perfect sense to us. We haven't changed all that much. So we read an old story like Judges. And we look back at our own life and we see this same cycle, right? You got into trouble when you were a teenager. So you said, Oh Lord Jesus, if you just get me out of this mess, I'll serve you always. And he got you out. And you did serve for a little while. Then you had another crisis. Oh Lord, get me out of this mess. And you did serve for a little while. And now you're somewhere in repeating that cycle all over again. Some of you are here because God has recently gotten you out of a mess and you promised you'd be in church every time the doors were open. So here you are. Some of you, this will be the last time you come for a while because you think you've done enough to pay for the last time that the Lord got you out of trouble. And the cycle starts all over again. That's not how you were intended to live. Amen. Not at all. You were intended to live out of the overflow of the love of Christ that flows in you, through you, out of you, to those people around you. Your life is to be the fountain that never runs dry because Christ is the center of everything you are and do. And it starts with this first moment of commitment, of understanding that there are no gods but God. Anything that is a compromise to the God that we serve is a pun. Sinfulness always ends in slavery. Okay, you always make this decision and the Baal, the Ashtoreth, the gods of the world end up taking you as a slave. And you end up in places where you can't make your own decision. Don't you? You're owned by this world. It starts this morning with the profession that there is no God but our God. And yes, that is exclusive. And it's exclusive because it's true. Amen. The reason we need is, and I tell you this before, uh, uh, glory has another meaning. It means weight. And we know about weight and mass is that's what causes gravity. And God is saying to you, I'm the only one with the glory, the mass to be in the center of your world that will hold all of your world in its orbit. Put something else, put someone else in the middle of your life and everything falls out of orbit. Amen. Now you read Judges and say, I wouldn't do that. We already have. And this is the morning we can get refocused on the one God who can keep us in the promised land. The one danger is after all we have seen and after all we know at Brentwood Baptist Church is that this would be the generation who forgot. Let's pray together.
this moment with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, just thinking about your own life in this moment. The cycle starts all over again, doesn't it? I don't know where you are in that cycle. I just know it gets very, very tiring. And you know better. You know it's not going to end where you think it is. It's going to end in some kind of destruction, some kind of slavery. And this is the morning to refocus your life on your commitment with Jesus Christ. And, and as you do that, go back and find one of our ministers at the Next Step table and let us pray for you. And more than that, let us help you find a group that can be family to you on this journey. Brothers and sisters who will walk with you, who will hang with you. So you don't have to do this all by yourself. You'll have others with you. I think that is an incredibly important part of our walk in Christ. For some of you, be the first step to become a member of Brentwood Baptist Church. We'd love to help you. We'd love to have you. We'd love to help you get that process started. Others, it's the very first decision. You just know you don't know who you are. And this is the morning you find out. Jesus died for your past mistakes, your sins. His resurrection gives you an opportunity for life. You don't even know what's possible, but it's yours for the asking. Now I know I'm saying a whole lot, just a handful of words. Our pastors, our counselors are standing out next to a, a table and the foyer. Sign says, next steps, they're waiting for you. All you have to do is say, hey, I want to know more about what Mike was talking about. They'll pick it up from there. I beg you, do not leave this moment with that question unanswered. Lord Jesus, every life is open before you, every heart. So we pray that the choices we make now are exactly what you want.